to succeed, what we need to know is that we need to work as a team. I've always said that FireSmart is a team sport and we do need to work together all of the aspects of our community in order to deal with this issue. So I've included a lot of visual examples in this uh, presentation tonight. And I want to acknowledge my partner in crime here uh, for my recent work in, in research end of things. And this presentation is a collaboration between myself and Dr. Jack Cohen from the United States uh, Forest Service. Jack's got, he's probably the preeminent scientist in North America in this field and definitely one of the three or four top people in the entire world. He's worked world, worldwide on this problem for more than 30 years, and he is an actual physicist, a fire physicist, but there aren't too many of those. And I had the pleasure to work with him on uh, several recent projects, including the examination of the Lytton fire that we did most recently, and a couple of other projects that we've been working on for the BC uh, Fire Smart Committee. So I just wanted to say that. And uh, kind of just, I don't think any of us, I hope, have had um, to deal with losing their home to a wildland urban fire disaster. I know I haven't, but having walked in the ashes of several communities that were destroyed, uh, I know from the bottom of my heart that this is something that we don't want to experience ever. Uh, it's a life-changing event, and uh, that's, it's good that we can... It's avoidable. So this is, uh, what would success look like? This is how I would see it. Certainly, uh, this is what I hope we see in the, the headlines. I've got uh, someone from the local paper here tonight that uh, the wildfire happens, but we go back to work, we go back to home, and life carries on uh, in a relatively short period of time. And also, it's very important to acknowledge, especially in the ecosystem that we're in right here in Williams Lake, is that wildland fires, fire is an incredibly important natural process in the evolution of our ecosystems. It determines many of the, the, the features, the biodiversity, the ecological things, the wildlife habitat that's around us, the things that we know and love about living here. And, um, it's a natural, but at the same time, it's a natural hazard. And the source of those fires has been twofold over thousands of years, uh, both from lightning, which is ongoing, but secondarily and also incredibly important is the use of fire by our indigenous people, which happens all around the world, but especially in ecosystems like we're in today. So we have to acknowledge that, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that since uh, colonization by Europeans, our attempts to exclude fire from the ecosystem have had some very serious impacts on all of those ecological factors, but also um, on, the, on the amount of fuel that we have. And we call this the wildfire paradox. It, it's ironic, but our attempts to exclude fire, and they've been successful to a certain extent, have actually increased the amount of fuel on the ground and increased the risk that we're at, and increased the probability of future extreme intensity wildfires. So that's our dilemma. How can we manage wildland fire? So it's doing the appropriate things on the landscape, but at the same time, uh, without having community destruction, fire destruction, and that's, that's one of the questions, the question that we hope to answer tonight. So, with all, given all of that, there's a big wild card. In the last 20 years, we see that the area burned from wildland fires has more than doubled. And the uh, effects, you know, are, are very direct on us in the fire business. The, the droughts are longer and more severe. Um, they're um, more frequent. We have a lot more frequent high wind events. Uh, we can't necessarily count on winter precipitation, which is the big issue in central Alberta right now. And also the amount of lightning for every degree of uh, climate warming, we see about a 10% increase in lightning. So ignitions are up. So we're on a, on a pretty serious course. I also want to point out that these kind of fire disasters are not new, not at all. 
They've been with us in North America for as long as uh, we've had concentrations of people. Um, and I've got a picture of the bottom left there is my wife's hometown where she was raised, her parents, her grandparents lived. And in 1908, the entire city of Fernie's, 5,000 peoples, was uh, incinerated in nine, just 90 minutes. Very similar to Lytton. And uh, all, all but 37 homes were destroyed in that fire. So it's not a new issue, but something that you know, comes to mind, in my mind at least, is that when we compare Fernie in 1908 to Fort McMurray in 2016, despite all of the uh, incredible advances that we've had in fire control and containment and fighting and fire detection, the outcomes are very similar. And that's a, there's a big discrepancy there. And that makes you wonder if we've been tackling this problem in the right sort of way. So let's start by looking at the patterns of fire destruction in uh, a number of these disastrous wildfires. And this is uh, probably heard of the campfire, the biggest uh, insured loss in, in US history, thousands and thousands upon homes. But when you look at this picture, what strikes you about the patter, pattern of burning that went on here? Buildings. What about the buildings? They're, they're all destroyed. Exactly, and this, is, uh, and this it would be really surprising to most people because, uh, but you're exactly right. You know, how was it that this beastly fire burned the homes and not the, the trees within the community? And this is, this is really the pattern that we have. We really do focus on the destruction. Certainly this is what grabs the media and the big flames, but we don't see what the rest is. And that the rest of the story is telling us an important story. And that is, it's very typical. Virtually all fires like this ha have this pattern. Um, but it does not support our, our mindset or our view that we have that fires just roll through a community like a, a tsunami, like a flood or an avalanche, like some incredible force that just keeps on pushing right through the community. Uh, that's not the case. The wildfire flames do not push through communities. There's another anomaly, and that's in the time of burning. We often, we see very frequently, almost, well, virtually all of the time, that the homes are burning long after the forest fire has made its move and perhaps moved through the community, in some cases without ever even getting there. And this, so we see this delayed ignition of homes. Here's another situation, another fire, a famous one in New Mexico, where a, a relatively low intensity fire, surface fire, came out of the forest. Uh, <laughs> it was an understory burn at this point, but once it reached the neighborhood, once it reached people's homes and properties, it picked up intensity, and there you see the result. Again, hundreds of homes were lost. This is an aerial view of yet another fire taken by Jack. Uh, late, late at night, uh, many hours after the wildfire passed through the, the forest, the adjacent forest. But I'll just speed it up here. You can see a lot of homes burning in, in all stages of ignition. Some are just starting. But you can see that the, the, this fire is now burning in the community, in the community fuels, uh, and pushing in the same direction of the wind, just like a wildfire would, but it's burning in residential fuels instead. Let's see. Okay, yet another fire. The unconsumed tree canopies, here's where the homes were. And what in fact we see more often than not is that the trees that are scorched uh, were not, they were burned as a result of burning homes. It wasn't that the trees in the community were igniting homes. The, the vice versa. So again, another example in, in California, I think, or Texas, Arizona, of fire, wildfires not spreading through the dense communities. The residential fire did. So that's what we, 
we understand now about this problem is that homes continue to ignite for many hours after the significant wildfire is long gone at the community's edge. Time and again, this is the pattern. And here's another very uh, good example. Um, in this case, at Lake Tahoe in California, uh, years of work had been done in the surrounding forest. There was a very intense wildfire burning under high winds. And you can see it was a full-on crown fire at the top of the picture here, moving kind of from left to right. And here was a fire guard, a creek, and the beginning of treated fuels where the forest was uh, thoroughly thinned out. And you can see that the crown fire intensity stopped, but the, the surface fire continued to burn through the treated fuels. And once it, picked it reached the community, it picked up intensity full on again and burned through the community, ironically, until it reached another forested area and a road. Um, but the community was destroyed. In this situation, um, the yellow square there is more than a kilometer from any forest fire activity. Yet again, hours after that wildfire, we see new homes igniting in all stages of burning. Uh, so how are these homes igniting? The big flames aren't getting there. The radiant heat from the forest fire is far, far away. It's not a factor. What's your guess? How are these homes igniting? It's got something to do with the wildland fire. What do you think it is? Embers. Embers, yeah. Sparks, embers transmitting far ahead uh, of the wildfire. And here's a, another uh, incredible ex example from Jack Cohen of a crown fire approaching a community. It's burning full crowns, very tall trees. It's consumed rows of homes on the right. It comes to a, a small, relatively small fuel break, which was sufficient to prevent flames from igniting the trees on the other side of the road. It was sufficient to, that the radiant heat, I'm sure these trees have been scorched, they'll turn red, some of them will, but uh, they didn't ignite. But the homes on the other side of the road, same pattern, the homes were igniting. And again, your answer was right. We see total, total destruction on the other side, so how wide a fire, fire break do we need? How, how far can embers fly? And we know it's a long, long ways. We generally understand that most embers will fall within half a kilometer. They'll hit the ground from where they were generated, but there are many, that's maybe 90%, but there's the other 10%, and it's well known that they can ignite homes as far as nine kilometers away and have ignited homes uh, hours and hours before the wildfire got there, if it ever did. So what are these em embers consist of? They, they're generally small, kind of rays in size. There can be cones, they can be uh, small branches from trees, loose bark and twigs. Um, but I think the best analogy, the best way for us lay people to think about the ember issue is, think about the first winter storm on a blustery day and the first few snowflakes, and where, the, where do they pile up around your home? In the corners, in the nooks and crannies, in the cracks, the same places where over the rest of the year, needles and leaves pile up. So uh, think about, think, when you're thinking about embers, think about snowflakes and you'll understand. This is a part of my work in Fort McMurray and several places I was able to count over 200 burn holes per square meter just from embers. Uh, falling and uh, so that's an indication you know that's millions and millions of matches landing in your backyard during one of these incidents um, it's not a good thing uh, we need to be ready for those embers so this is what the bottom line you know it's burning embers whether they're glowing or flaming that are the principal ignition force in these wildland urban disasters not the big flames and to try and understand this, um, scientists in various places have gone to the extent of building giant labs where full-size homes have been constructed, placed on turntables, and exposed to showers of embers and high winds. And I'm going to play a little short video just uh, so this home was built with a whole wide range of different building materials. 
to test their resistance to embers and different kinds of vegetation placed around the home. There's uh, pine straw needles and also uh, wood chip mulch placed at the base of this home and some needles were put in the eaves troughs and the gullies of the roof and just uh, kind of will go to the we're testing uh, vinyl siding and uh, fiber cement, um, popularly called hardy board, and different kinds of fiber com composition board. So here's the kind of the real time. I'll speed it up a little bit. But you can see the embers where they're accumulating in the gullies and in the nooks and crannies. Uh, you can see that they're blasting away at the wall and piling up at the base of vertical walls. And you can see that almost immediately the pine needles and leaf litter is igniting, and you'll see that the wood chip mulch is soon to follow, and that it burns very intensely. The little uh, coniferous uh, shrubs here are picking up the fire. It's spreading vertically, and it's exposing that window to a lot of heat. You can see the vinyl siding starting to warp. When it's contacted by flames, it liquefies, and then it begins to burn intensely you'll see that the vinyl eaves troughs are starting to fall off and drip and burn hot. And as we progress through this progression, you'll see that the needles are burning in the gullies and in the eaves troughs. And if the roof isn't properly constructed, the asphalt shingles are resisting all kinds of fire here. They're good, but there's, if there's potential for um, fire to get under the shingles, uh, there's potential for an ignition. And you can see in this corner, this an eddy, just like if you're a river rafter, you see those little eddies? This is the wind really, really boring in and creating intense fire in places like that. It's pretty dramatic. Yeah, right. So that's what embers can do for us. They bring the fire to us. So, and this is, again, a kind of a summary slide that uh, when homes burn, they're a, a huge source of embers. And here's a real short video from California to show you that, you know, we think they're dense from a grass fire or a forest fire or a brush fire. Well, the embers from burning homes are even more efficient in terms of igniting adjacent homes. And you can see they're, they're bigger, they're better, and they almost splash when they land. Kind of a scary scenario. I'm glad it was a fast emergency. <laughs> Happy to see you back. So we're talking about um, th the delayed fire situation. This is a really excellent video. It was a doorbell camera from Fort McMurray. You can see that you know there's this neighborhood the fire did not reach except for embers. And um, there was a wood chip mulch uh, border on this flower bed that came right up into the staircase. It ig ignited underneath and the fire department responded and extinguished the fire. You'll see that they went away but again another report of smoke under the deck. This time they got really serious. They tore it all apart, brought all the equipment again and worked until they were quite confident that the fire was extinguished. Okay, we're good, right? Well, no, take three, uh, doorbell camera video. The fire just, this is what smoldering fire can do for you. It progressed right underneath to the pylons and into the attic, and actually the attic was fully involved with fire in this situation. I, I don't know if the home survived, but it was apparently that the doorbell camera didn't. So, but that just really shows you this insidious, like uh, what embers can do and those ignitions can sit there and sit there for days at a time in Kelowna homes and Fort McMurray days afterwards, homes were just popping up and burning. So, and that also has the impact of tying up our firefighters unnecessarily. So I want to talk a little bit about how fire spreads here because that's elemental to our understanding of stopping it, right? Or not igniting. So it's a stepwise process uh, that moves. We all understand that fuel, heat, and oxygen are required, but it, 
you know, oftentimes fire is characterized as being kind of a living a beast or a monster that's thinking. It can turn on a dime. It can do this. It can do that. Well, it's not true. Um, fire isn't a thing. It's not that monstrous force that we think. It's, it's a simple process, that a stepwise process that, that moves progressively. And for each object that ignites, this process happens. We have here a block of wood that's heated. And when it's heated to high temperatures, it, it emits flammable vapors, which mix with oxygen. And when we get a small ignition, pilot ignition, if it's an ember or match or whatever it is, then we see that flaming combustion start. And this process goes on so rapidly that we can't even imagine it, but it's happening from needle to needle and tree to tree. It's a progressive process. And if those conditions for combustion, if the right amount of heat and a fuel isn't present, fire stops. So that's all physics. It's complex. But how many people here have ever sat around a campfire? OK, how many have not? OK, we, you'll understand this then. Because it's really, a, I call it campfire physics. Um, you understand that when you're lighting your campfire, what do you use? Do you start with the big blocks of timber? No, we start, don't say gasoline, OK? <laughs> no Boy Scouts allowed. No, we make kindling, the finest fuels that we can. They're most easily ignited. They help uh, you know, brought to that temperature. So we use kindling. We don't start with big chunks of wood. When we build our fire, where do we build it? We build it far enough away from our tent. Why? Well, sparks. And what else? Flames. We want to be out of reach of the flames. And we want to be far enough away from the radiant heat. And we know that if we're sitting beside a campfire and the flames start to increase, how far do we move back? Do we move back 30 or 40 meters? No, we just have to edge back a few inches. And that's because radiant heat decreases very quickly over very short distances. But um, yeah, where do we put our kindling and our next pieces of wood? We don't put them between the tent and the campfire. We put them up well out of reach so they don't ignite from radiant heat. And we're always watchful of embers. So I think you understand a lot more about fire than you might have thought. So it's exactly the same scenario in and around our homes. And wildfire spreads by meeting those conditions for combustion. And it's the same thing for the residential fuels at our home. And whenever there's insufficient fuel or not enough heat, what happens then? Fire goes out or it doesn't ignite. Right. So that's the big aha here, really. The lesson is here that we have a structural ignition problem. It's not a wildfire control problem. So can, does that make sense to you now? That, that the wildfire is doing its thing. It sends us embers, but it's burning in our residential fuels. And it's a matter of how ignition resistant or how vulnerable our materials around our homes are. So we've been, we've been dealing this as a wildfire control problem with, uh, for generations of us firefighters. So it's time that we need to kind of turn our thinking around. So in the fuels, in this case, is things around our homes or our homes themselves. And the heat that we're most worried about is those burning embers or the things around our homes that ignite from embers and pass that heat on to our homes. So the question then becomes, well, how big of an area do we have to influence um, to deal with this kind of fire? And there's three kind of sources or approaches that have been taken to study this problem. And one is uh, physics modeling, uh, where the factors are the intensity of fire. And we know well, we need to be thinking about the intensity of the hottest wildfire we can imagine. So they did. They need to be thinking about the time of exposure from a forest fire, which is generally a pretty short period of time in any given spot, and the distance between. The results of the modeling were that they predicted that if the wildfire was more than 30 meters away, 
it could not ignite a wooden surface. That's what the models predicted. So the next stage was to do a bunch of experiments. And for a period of almost 15 years, some of the wildfire guys here might have been involved in this uh, in the Northwest Territories. They burned very large blocks, hectare and a half of fire were accelerated to full on uh, crown fire intensities. And they placed all kinds of objects, wooden walls and small cabins built of various kinds of material at various distances from these fires. And what they learned as a result of many years of study was that wall sections that were placed 10 meters away from fires like that, they would scorch, they might ignite momentarily, they usually self-extinguished, but at 20 and 30 meters, none of those wood walls burned, nor were they severely scorched. They didn't show signs of charring. So that confirmed that what the model was saying, in fact, saying that the model had overpredicted a bit. And then the third source of information is field examinations, of which Jack Cohen has probably done 30 of these, and, and I've done uh, two or three, and the last one with Jack. But they also provide us some really important clues and some great examples. Here's just one. This is an area here where there was three, two or three full-size urban engines and crews were fighting a fire that was approaching this road. There's homes just on the other side. The fire got so hot that they had to bail out, of course, to life safety issues. And afterwards, you know, all of the homes on the far side of this road had burned and were destroyed. And they were feeling really down in the dumps, thinking, well, this is our fault. Maybe we could have stopped this. Well, they couldn't have stopped it, but it wasn't their fault. What we s was observed when Jack came back to the site was, well, here's a cedar rail fence and uh, leafy vegetation just on the other side of the road. None of that burned. The leaves were damaged by the heat, but they did not burn. The fence did not burn. It was enough to, it would have certainly hurt the firefighters, but it was the embers that went across the road. So again, it wasn't a matter of defending from the flames. So at the end of the day, this area of influence that determines whether or not a home ignites or not, is called the home ignition zone. And I'll bet almost everybody's heard that term because it's been embedded in FireSmart for, for many years. There's been some minor changes to it, but uh, basically it's the home and 30 meters uh, surrounding the home and it, all the pieces. Uh, it consists of three concentric zones now that extend out from the, the outer walls of the home and attachments. And we'll talk about each of those zones in a few minutes in detail, but that's the home ignition zone. That's the, the area that determines whether or not a home ignites and whether or not a home is destroyed is that little area there. And one of the most, uh, I think the most instructive piece of video that I've ever seen was taken uh, during the evacuation by a fellow that had dash cams on the front and back of his truck. Um, and this is, is looking out his back window. Uh, when I went back there a couple of, a week later, I actually found this guy. We followed the path that he took and we, we re-looked at this, at this fire situation. So to set the stage, the conditions were extreme. Uh, there were high winds blowing and extraordinarily dry fuels because they just didn't get the winter precipitation. And just like this year in Alberta, they had a really hot spell in May, almost the same time as what we're encountering right now. This fire is approaching, it's burning. It has crossed, crossed the, the Horse River or a large river at the base of this hill and it's burning up towards this neighborhood. Uh, and so that sets the scene. And this is a real-time video. The fire is really moving faster at, at the back, but this is the evacuation. This is a solid line of people leaving the, the city of Fort McMurray. The motorcyclist, you know, there's a lot of heat here that's full crowning fire, probably 60 meter flames above the treetops. Uh, and you can see a lot of spot fires igniting here, 
I want to stop for a second. You can see a lot of spot fires starting along the, uh, in the dry grass. We've got a road here, a sidewalk, a boulevard, and grass that has not yet greened up. So this is about a 45 meter fuel break. And I want you to watch these flames. What do they do? Tell me if you see them going, arcing across and contacting homes. It doesn't happen. We're at full crown fire intensity here now. It's getting hot enough, the radiant heat, that this motorcyclist is going to burn out of there. Bad terminology, sorry. He's leaving because he's uncomfortable, but vehicles aren't igniting. There isn't human lives being lost, and no homes have ignited from this fire, and no homes will ignite. But you can see spot fires starting. There's one here in a flower bed full of... Uh, Wood chip mulch, drive leaves, a hedge, uh, some ornamental junipers, and a pine tree right up here against the house. You can see back here, the forest fire is burned out, but the, the embers are getting really intense. You can see lots of spot fires starting here. And you can see one here, similar kind of flower bread arrangement with uh, junipers and wood chip mulch. So this is real time, folks. The fire has burnt out in the forest now. The flames are here. They're not coming across. The radiant heat isn't enough to ignite homes. It's embers starting lots of little spot fires. And in 35 seconds, this home is well engaged in fire. They have a wooden deck right there between the, the, the vegetation, their landscaping, and their front window. And I'm willing to bet that that fire has gone through the front window by now. You'll see a couple, they have a couple of big, those column junipers igniting in the back door. So that's, that's a real situation. That's how it happens. And I think this is the best proof, that, visual proof that, that we can show you, that it's not the big flames, it's the roll of embers. And you can see that happening. So I investigated and pinpointed the exact places where those spot fires ignited and this is what I found, yes, I already told you, uh, lots of uh, very highly combustible vegetation, a wood chip mulch bed which is very receptive to embers and the fire spread through those to the deck and to the home. So again, this is telling us that the wildfire is a structure ignition problem, it's not about the wildfire control. in that small, relatively er important, but critical zone of influence, the home ignition zone. I wanna show you quickly a little bit about the Lytton exam, what we, our findings were at Lytton, and how that fire evolved. It was like virtually all other major wildland urban fires, extreme conditions. We're close enough here at Williams Lake to know, you know how high those winds were, 40 kilometers or so, gusts to, to more than that, how hot and dry the fuels were from that heat dome that we experienced. But here again, this is post-fire. Um, all the, the, uh, the vegetation had been destroyed. And this is kind of the best depiction of a ground blizzard of burning embers that Lytton was experiencing. So here's the pattern of the fire. The fire originated in this basin, a low kind of bowl at the south end of town. The winds were blowing from south to north, right towards town, and this bowl was in elevation below the town. So once the ignition, the fire spread on four different uh, fronts, really. It, it burned below the town to the left, above the Fraser River. It burned along the right-of-way uh, in um, of the railway and the Trans-Canada Highway, and it burned into the town uh, almost immediately. It was uh, reaching homes on the edge of town, and then across the highway into um, uh, reserve number 17. So what was it burning in? Again, th this is striking. It wasn't burning in the forest fuels at all. It was burning in pine needles and dead grass, weeds, and a bit of brush, patchy brush. Uh, along this way, but it was moving. It was an intense surface fire, and it was moving quickly in that wind, 
but it was generating lots of embers. It's not just trees that generate embers. So it's important to look at the chronology. The fire was detected at 438. And 15 minutes later, it was already kind of midtown. This is one of the, looking from the Main Street, flames were, were roaring past um, the downtown area. And in less than half an hour, the fire had crossed the Trans-Canada Highway in at least two different places. This is a photo taken by a fire responder uh, w with his dash cam. And uh, what's this? This is maybe 40 minutes after there were homes igniting already in the town. But in 40 minutes, the fire had already reached, uh, burned in the grassy fuels all the way to the far end of town. And while it was doing that, it was exposing homes all along those perimeters to ember showers. And at six o'clock, we have a photo taken by the bird dog, BC Wildfire Service. And in that, we can see at least 20 structures fully involved in fire in uh, about a, less than an hour and a half. And there's likely more homes than that because we can't see through all of the dense smoke in the center of the town. So what could we expect? There's no way we could have expected an effective wildfire response in that situation, uh, typical of these kinds of disasters. Uh, the fire's too hot, it's moving too fast, and it's there. In this case, the fire didn't start miles away, it started meters away from the, the town site. It wouldn't have mattered what started that fire, uh, that's pr quite irrelevant to the results. And also, when we look at the wildland situation, or the structural situation, um, it would have taken probably about 60 engines and 250 firefighters to deal with 20 burning homes. Again, no, not a possible or any kind of a reasonable response. They would have been overwhelmed. And I wanna pause for a moment here and say that, you know, this is not on the backs of firefighters. Now, we're not targeting them in any way. In fact, you should know that your wildland firefighters have about a 97% success rate. When you look at the number of wildfires we have, thousands and thousands, about 97% of those are extinguished when they're very small, less than two hectares, and very quickly. And that's an important fact. But those 3% that we can't tackle are actually responsible for about 95% of all the area that's burned. And that doesn't matter if you're in the Yukon or Newfoundland or British Columbia, those statistics pretty well hold true. Those are the, the top 3%, the most intense fires that really are beyond our physical limits of our capability to control. And that's, that's just the way it is. It's beyond uh, our capability and um, and it's not, the answer isn't another bomber, it's not another fire truck. And on the structural side, you know, we're, firefighters are also very successful, except under these extreme conditions. So, it was, the wildfire did not spread through the community, it spread along the edges and it was tossing embers. A lot of homes ignited in a very short period of time, and the fire burned in those residential materials and found vulnerabilities in the homes which ignited, and then the fire spread from structure to structure. And that was the same pattern that we see in all of these disasters. It's actually got a name. We call it the fire disaster sequence, and it always starts with those severe conditions. Um, we get a wildland fire that's spreading very quickly at extreme intensity, and we get a lot of ignitions it overwhelms any conceivable response that we can muster. And as a result, we get a disaster. And when these fires are analyzed, there's probably about 30 of them that fit into this category in the United States, and virtually all of them fall into the same situation. Extreme winds, extremely dry fuel. You know, it's that 3% that give us problems in the wildland, and that's what's causing our, our issues here. 
So nothing, nothing's effective in terms of control under those conditions. And it's just it's kind of a, that's, th that's the real world. And we don't need to be pointing fingers. But I think it would be good for us to be, me as a wildland firefighter, certainly, to be humble now and prepare for that situation than to get humbled later. So we have to recognize that there are limits. And that's, uh, that's the position paper of the Canadian Forest Fire Center and all of the wildland agencies. You know, we know that we've reached that point uh, where additional resources are not going to tackle that last 3% and that economically it's also impossible even if physically it was. So that kind of, that's kind of a bleak picture. Uh, we're admitting to the fact that wildfires are inevitable and we're admitting to the fact that there, we have inability to control the, the most extreme fires under those conditions. So disasters must be inevitable too, right? Well, the answer is a big no. It's not a hopeless situation. And I hope that you understand the answer to that already. And that is that the conditions that determine if fire spreads or fire ignites in and around our homes is under our control. Fa they fall within that 30 meter zone and uh, we can do things about that. And that's kind of where we want to go next in our presentation tonight, that uh, we can mitigate those risky situations, the vulnerabilities and the fire exposure that we have without controlling the wildfire. And we call that fire smart. That's fire smart by definition. How do we increase the resistance, re ignition resistance of our homes? And that's how this sequence can be broken. It doesn't have to happen this way. If home, the very <laughs> impeccable logic of Jack Cohen, if a house doesn't ignite, it can't burn, right? And if a house doesn't burn, we can't have a disaster if homes don't burn. So disaster is avoided and we know the answers. So. What it is it about this home ignition zone, this, uh, sorry, yeah, home ignition zone, what is it about that, the characteristics that make it work? First of all, there's no high intensity burning of structures or of the vegetation around the homes within that zone. Second of all, there's no long duration burning of other objects whether it's boats, RVs, tool sheds, wood piles, you know, piles of old lumber. There's no long duration burning uh, within zones one and two. That is within, within 10 meters of the house. And thirdly, there's no flame contact with buildings from even low intensity fires that are incurring. As we go closer to the home, the fire intensity is reduced and reduced and reduced and then all burning and flames or smoldering fire ceases within that 1.5 meter zone. That's your ultimate fire break right there. So the intensity of fires continually is reduced in that 30 meters and we get to the state where the only thing that's left to deal with is the embers that are falling on the structure itself. And the answer to those is fire resistant building materials and building designs. Again, not necessarily, cre uh, not at all rebuilding structures, but just little things and thinking like an ember and dealing with those situations. The last issue that we have to think about in this scenario is that we, we're not alone in urban areas. You know, we have a lot of neighbors and the fact that fires can spread from one home to another. So this is that same neighborhood uh, before the fire, Beacon Hill. And here's the position of those two ignitions. But how did we get to the point from a whole neighborhood like that in two ignitions to more than 90% of the homes being destroyed? That's the fact that fire spreads from one home to the other, either through embers or just directly because there's flame contact, or most often radiant heat is too long lasting and leads to ignition. So we have to deal with that issue of overlapping homes. 
and ho overlapping home ignition zones. And that's why we need such good cooperation. This is a neighborhood issue. It's not just an individual is issue. You know, we have to work at this problem with our neighbors so that fire doesn't spread between our homes. And here's the situation, just kind of an aerial view. You know, if we looked at one of those homes that ignited, the fire does start spreading out and fanning out from each of those early igniting homes. It doesn't only happen to homes on the edge of the community because those embers are falling well within the community. Um, lots of examples of these kind of nuclei ignitions starting well within the middle of um, Fort McMurray and other uh, urban centers. But here's, here's a hopeful picture, um, one that I took in Fort McMurray. Uh, this is another neighborhood, the same process as Beacon Hill. Um, the fire approached, but these guys were right on the front line. This newer development here, this group of homes totally survived. This is uh, after these green trees had bloomed out. They weren't green at the time of the fire, but no damage here. When I assessed those homes, they were excellent condition, and, but the embers leapt over those, and that same process occurred, and there was massive destruction farther away from the wildfire from them as a result of amber ignition. So just a another pair of dramatic photos. Um, if we make our homes in ignition resistant, mean that means that we can have wildfires uh, and go, go, back, go back home. So incredibly intense wildfire burning the same home here. And you might see a lot of things that you think were highly ign ignitable but not, not necessarily so. Okay, now we're going to uh, focus on uh, solutions. What can we do? Just kind of looking at the big picture for a moment, uh, thinking about emergency management as it applies broadly to all kinds of things, but there are four basic components to that. The planning and preparedness, which the round table's been heavily in, engaged in. Uh, the second one is prevention and it gets lumped with mitigation. Those are the proactive things we can do in advance. But where we wind up spending an awful lot of our time and effort and, and certainly uh, most of our money is on response. And then what we find in these, in these extreme situations uh, when we have fire that overwhelms us and we wind up with uh, wildland urban disasters is recovery costs that are just astronomical and as we saw in Fort McMurray over four billion dollars but when you added up all the social costs and uninsured losses and things like that it's probably it was definitely more than double of that so what we're focusing here on is mitigation and is it by far the poor sister of the of the of the four legs of emergency management, but this is really where our salvation is, and we really need to, it's, it's all on your shoulders now. <laughs> <laughs> but we want you to know that all of us can be working with you and need to be working with you to make this work. So um, congratulations on your new position. But fire smart by definition is mitigation of the risk so that we don't have to deal with response and recovery. It's a good place to spend our money our resources. And that's what I've been advocating for a long time is that we really do need to focus uh, where the losses are occurring and as it turns out that's where we can make a difference to that problem is in uh, at close to the center of the bullseye in our home ignition zones and right within our communities. And just another example, uh, here's a home ignition zone with the, all the right risk mitigations on the left here. Uh, we see it's surrounded by a forest that has burned intensively. There was no possibility and no need for wildfire response in that situation. On the other hand, we have a scenario without fire smart risk mitigations. And uh, really the forest didn't burn, but the structure did. Uh, but again, once again, it's more often this case that uh, fire protection wasn't available or was overwhelmed in that situation. So that's, the, that's our choices, uh, risk mitigation or not. And so it comes down to the ignition vulnerability of the home itself. 
in relation to the things that could be burning very close to the home, within 30 meters of it. And that's what's caused those contrasting results. When I did my examination in Fort McMurray, I looked at hundreds and hundreds of homes and it did you know, well over 100 detailed assessments of homes that had burned, homes that had not burned, and a very high percentage of the homes that survived were rated as being very fire smart, have de been dealt with all of the little things or most of the little things that make a difference. On the other hand, two thirds of the homes that were destroyed were rated very poor um, and at extreme hazard. So it shows once again, and we can be sure that fire smart risk mitigations, these measures do work. So how do we do that? Um, there's Jack Cohen. Um, two things, we've got to find those vulnerabilities that exist on the home primarily, and we need to find what is it that's around our home that could uh, potentially ignite and expose our house to flames and help the fire spread directly to our, our home. That's the two approaches that we need to take and who of, of all the people in the universe can have the biggest impact on that situation? <coughs> well, no, it's not the firefighters, although they play a critical role here. Uh, mostly it's you and me, us homeowners, our property owners, our business owners, whether we live in an acreage or a dense urban area, um, we control most of the factors to do with our own property and we like it that way, right? <laughs> so, um, but I mentioned uh, the fire authorities. We really do need their support. They are the knowledgeable people. They are actually the best possible mentors that we could have. We need them to help out uh, citizens and residents and groups of residents by providing, you know, kind of that educational and mentoring role as facilitators of fire smart activities. And we also need the collaboration um, from civic and municipal authorities and other landowners, like whether it's CN Rail or the Highways Department or BC Hydro, we need them to support residents that are doing things because we don't own all of our home ignition zone. Uh, in lots of cases, they overlap with somebody else's property, but we need the permission to go and do things that will reduce our risk. Uh, and. Uh, that's possible too. So again, it's all about cooperation and how can we re achieve those uh, ignition resistant zones. Uh, most of the things that we'll talk about tonight are small actions. They're pretty inexpensive. They just mostly require a little bit of time. They're not high tech. They don't require big machines. And there are little things that mostly, for the most part, we can putter away in our own backyards and solve one thing at a time. And uh, <laughs> we visited a campground yesterday, one of the sites we looked at, the porch is fixed <laughs> at the campground wow. already. He put a new fire resistant front on the porch of, of the campground. So that's how long it took once he realized that there was an issue. Great example. So exposures and vulnerabilities. And I want to just kind of look collectively, when I've looked at these through a number of studies, the vast majority of the exposures that we have are to deal with our landscaping, the vegetation that we choose to put around how much, what kind, how close together it is, the things that we plant on our property. And you know, in some situations, it's what's left over of the native vegetation. But vegetation is a big, big deal. Other thing or where are embers going to ignite on our structures? We need to find those, and those account for a certain amount of the, the issues. And surprisingly, uh, when it comes to structures, it's a relatively small proportion of the issues we have are those vulnerabilities of the structure, which is good, because a few of those are expensive, like replacing a roof. Very few of us have an ignitable roof. That's a bad example. But again, it's little things um, that result in homes being destroyed. That's the distribution now. So let's look at the structural, the home itself, the structural features. And of course, the first thing is the roof. And this is something we've understood 
probably the first thing we understood about wildland urban fire disasters, what a combustible wooden roof, putting kindling on your roof was a bad idea. And it was almost certain that it would ignite from embers and you had an extremely high pr probability of burning from the top down. And here's an example of that. These embers are landing in the forest adjacent to this home, creating a little circular fire here. But they're also creating lots of circular fires on this person's roof, whereas the embers are falling on this guy's roof too, but they're not. It's just a plain, ordinary asphalt roof, which is fully fire resistant uh, on a properly installed roof. So we've, but we've dealt with that. That's a rare thing these days to see, see uh, um, untreated wood shake roofs in most urban areas. So here's another example of uh, accumulation of needles and fine fuels. You know, always happens in, in predictable kinds of places. But when they burn and they expose, in this case, they got into the under the to the plywood that's underneath. Uh, the shingles, it wouldn't have mattered if it was a metal roof or not, if the plywood underneath is exposed and there's no flashing, well this is what can result. Another big issue, one of the top few, is the fact that uh, homes can have openings where embers get driven into. They're traveling at high rates of speed. When they hit a wall, they're often jetted up or jetted down. But if there's an opening like a, a broken soffit or a vent that doesn't have a fine three millimeter screen mesh behind it, those embers get into the house. And we see that kind of that delayed action. You know, they get in there and they poop around until they finally gather enough smoldering steam. They hit something that ignites, they get the pilot ignition and bingo, this is what we see. So openings in homes are bad things, whether it's under, on top, on the roof, Another thing, you know, we talked about, you know, how to start your campfire. It's not with big chunks of sound wood. And what we do know now is that large dimension wood is quite resistant to ignitions. Uh, if it's full of punky knots and rotted and weathered and kind of starting to decay, it's very easily ignited. But so maintaining uh, wood surfaces in clean condition, getting rid of that debris and disconnecting any, any components of, of decks or things like that or stairs from burning fuels on the ground uh, really pre helps prevent ignitions. Here we have a stairway, probably some fine fuels on the ground, grassy fuels, but wooden rotten stairs that are easily ignited and that's going to spread, has spread fire directly to the, to the structure. Here's something you won't see in any of the fire smart manuals yet because it comes out of the understandings that we've had more recently, but what we call inside corners, where a horizontal surface like this wall meets a vertical, sorry, vertical, this is vertical up and down, right? Sorry, <laughs> carried away, meets a horizontal surface like this. The embers are for certain going to accumulate in that place there, and if that's vulnerable, then they're gonna build up a lot of heat. The other situation will be like the corner behind me. We call that a cube corner. There's two vertical walls and one floor, and that is probably the world's best place for embers to accumulate. So we need to make sure that when they're landing here and accumulating, they're landing on something that won't ignite. You know, that there's some kind of a flashing of fire resistant material at the base there. And uh, if we deal with those, we've solved a big problem and it doesn't take much. So uh, another thing, you know, um, vertical wor wooden surfaces that are facing out, if they're within 30 meters of a high intensity fire, that could be an ignition source. So it's best to replace those kinds of things with uh, non-combustible things like wood rails. And here's a set of stairs, you know, if the stairs are open and embers can fall down onto a gravel surface or something, you've eliminated both a couple of cube corners and an inside corner. So another thing is make sure that fine fuels don't accumulate in places like between the planks, wooden planks of, of decks and things like that. And then it's really easy for us, even though we're not fire engineers,
to think about you know, all the combustible things that are placed around our homes. And if they did burn, what would happen? You know, are they going to put flames into contact with parts of our homes? So those things need to be moved away or managed, stored properly. And of course, there's always things that will be on your deck, but you know, things that should just take a few seconds to get rid of, uh, not hours. So another of Jack's saying is, if it's attached to the house, it is part of the house. And what we see time and again is that com combustible fences provide a pathway for, for fire to get to the house. So we need to find a, a way of disconnecting those flammable structures uh, from the house. And it doesn't take much. Here's an, a real world example. I mean, at, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but they left the gate open. So there's a fire break, right? The fence burned, but it didn't transmit. It was hot enough to start warping the vinyl, but it didn't transmit fire directly across that gap. So we need to be thinking about those other pathways and the things that are connected. And the best way to deal with that is this no combustion zone. It's only been added maybe in the last two years or so as a fire smart element, but it's critically important. Uh, maybe the ultimate thing, I, as I said, it's the ultimate fire break. But any fire that gets to this zone, whether it's a falling ember or creeping surface fire from beyond, will stop burning when it gets to this. So we need an, a non-combustible surface. Now that could be the driveway, could be the walkway, it could be uh, a thin band of graveled surface, it could be green grass, irrigated lawn. It doesn't burn. So coming up to, again, a non-combustible outer surface, like the foundation wall of a home, that's critical. So here's an, some examples of here that being effective. You know, the house took some heat, warping again, but again, flames stopped before they got to the edge of the home. But here we have a flower bed that's got combustible items, and most certainly that home is likely going to ignite. So we have lots of situations, but again, all simple things. You know, how long would it take you to pull some shrubs out or replace them with something that's non combustible? around your yard. So one of the most critical things to do is, as we know, it's the kindling that's most easily ignited. We've got to get rid of that kindling and it's piling up all the time on us. So what I suggest is that spring and fall, we go about and be little detectives going around our yards and getting rid of all of those fine fuels, the dead leaves, the pine needles, the cones, all of that stuff that's ignited either on or not ignited but accumulated either on, under, or around our homes. We do that twice a year and we'll get rid of a lot of those ignition potential. And certainly, you know, when you combine uh, fine kindling type fuels like this with stuff like this under your deck, you know, that, that's just seconds away from being a fully ignited home. So that's not hard work, it's just being consistent and uh, puttering around your backyard. So here we have you know, a, a, a fire fully fire resistant home that's uh, structurally sound. All the forest around it's been thinned out adequately, looks like a lot of forest, but it's not going to carry fire uh, to the house, nor will it be a crown fire, it'll be just fire on the surface, but can you, can you spot a weakness in that situation or, or a broken mouse? No. <laughs> what's, what's the issue? Wood pile under the deck? Yeah, and I, I, I just can't see that there's that uh, non-combustion zone around the, the home. So, correct. Um, you've got it. Um, here we go. In a week and a half, the grass will be green. You know, next year the needles will turn green again, but the cabin is gone, all from that one little simple weakness um, that they left the firewood under there and they didn't have a non-combustion zone, which would have been easy to grub out in that situation. So let's... Uh,
I don't know what happened there, but we leapt ahead. Let's look at this zone one, which is from 1.5 meters to 10 meters. And again, um, a big part of that is managing and spacing out the shrubs that we got, choosing shrubs and trees, ideally that are deciduous. They carry a lot of moisture. They actually act as a bit of a shield. Uh, they don't ignite uh, very easily at all. But even our conifers must be treated properly and spaced out around the home. So it means mowing that grass just once a year when it stops growing and turns brown, get, uh, remove all in the, removing all shrubs and trees is not required, but they need to be separated by open spaces, two to three crown widths apart so that any crown fire activity doesn't happen and also that they're separated from fuel on the ground so they don't ignite and expose the house to flames. So that means pruning properly and removing the surface fuels on the ground and separating all the, the woody shrubs that we have and ideally removing the combustible evergreen shrubs and young, young evergreens. So we get a result like this, that the, the fire is burning intensely on the ground, but it does drop down in any smoldering fire. We just get small flames coming to that combustion zone and they stop. So we, get, we don't get any intensive fire in that zone. And also in that zone, a really important thing is to deal with any outbuildings we have, whether it's the kids' playhouse, our garage, a tool shed, a workshop. And this, is, this was a huge factor in the fires that I've seen, that uh, people have lots of small buildings. And they do need to be managed the same as your house. Because if they do ignite, they're a long-lasting source of really intense heat because uh, their they're contents burn as well, so that helps the fire spread from structure to structure on your own property. So we need to deal with the nooks and crannies and the vents and things like that in those structures that are close to home or move them farther away if you've got that option. So in zone two, from 10 meters out to 30 meters, this is really the zone where any high intensity fire or crown fire would drop down and become a, a, an active surface fire on the ground. So we got to get rid of all the accumulations of downed trees, branches, and, and accumulated fuels, and space the remaining trees there to, again, to two to three crown woods apart from trees. And really, I strongly encourage, you know, like the city of Williams Lake, from what I see, it's got a ton of big deciduous trees. Those are great, you know, there's none of those would ever need to come down. They just, you just need to manage the leaves and the litter that are coming from them that are really the hazard, but um, they are virtually invisible to fire. So that's how we deal with that outer, outer ring around our homes. And just a few more tips, you know, pruning trees. I see trees that are often pruned up to up to 20 meters. Really, the critical distance is to two and a half meters of pruning. So we create a gap between the ground and the surface fuels and, and, the, and the lowest tips of the hanging branches. But we also need to get rid of some of, some of these trees. You know, a 60-year-old tree has got a massive amount of fuel accumulated underneath it. That needs to be taken away and really encouraged to grow green grass or some non-combustible surface under those trees so the fire cannot spread vertically. So the spacing, again, as I emphasized, is super important of those trees. So if we have a properly treated home ignition zone, what are the benefits? So that gives us the potential that our home can withstand one of these events without any active fire protection. And that's more often the case than not because these are disaster situations. Folks like you are gonna be pretty busy evacuating people and hopefully because far fewer homes ignite, that gives our firefighters a chance to extinguish those few homes that do ignite and they do become more effective in that way. They're not overwhelmed. And also it's a much safer situation for us as residents if we're not running from 
hundreds of burning homes, which we don't want to do, and also for the safety of firefighters that are responding. So at the end of the day, what we have is a fire resilient community, which means we bounce back quicker, we come back home, we go back to work, and the landscape looks different, but our life goes on, you know, even with, with some inconvenience, but it's not, it's not destroyed. So in my mind, there is the one most effective program that we have, it's time tested in the United States, is what we call, uh, um, and it originated there. It's called the Fire Smart Neighborhood Recognition Program. And this is just a, a working example from the city of Fernie, where um, the fire chief uh, embraced this program. Um, his fire information officer became trained as a local fire smart representative, and two other of his part timers took that training and they actively worked as facilitators for this program, connecting with residents and getting them started along this eight step pathway which eventually leads to a fire resistant neighborhood. But over the span of three years, they were successful in, in uh, initiating this program in 17 neighborhoods, which expands out to about 800 homes, which literally involved over 2,000 residents. So over a third of the city, city's residents were involved in this. And area-wise, these neighborhoods were starting to clump together in three and four so we had whole large areas of uh, people working on fire smart initiatives. Uh, and the basic requirement is that one interested community member contacts a trained LFR, someone from the municipality or whoever it is. And they, they do a home uh, neighborhood assessment of the issues. They submit that report to um, the citizen is responsible to gather three or four others into a committee that that report is presented to them and it points out three or four things they could do to reduce the risk of their neighborhood. And over the, then they, uh, they produce a simple kind of two page plan on a form and that indicates that they're gonna tackle some of those priorities. And one day a year they gather as a group uh, to have a, a barbecue and tackle one of those issues. And that qualifies them to become a recognized neighborhood. But each year that, that grows, it's very infectious. And more and more people get involved in that program. But most important of all, they take what they learn uh, doing an activity together, they take that home and start doing it in their backyards. And it's hugely effective. So. It's a grassroots program, it's bottom up, it's driven by the citizens, it's aided and facilitated by trained professionals, but it doesn't take a lot of energy on our part and it's highly effective in getting a lot of people uh, doing good things. So that's, uh, that's my recommendation for how do we engage people best. Uh, it's effective also because you're dealing with a neighborhood and as we see, we need to get neighborhoods involved to deal with that issue of overlapping ignition zones. So bottom lines here, wildfires are inevitable, but disasters are not. We can avoid these. Uh, we need to recognize that they only occur under the extreme conditions that firefighters are gonna continue to deal with the 97%, but when these extraordinary conditions happen, that's when risk mitigations are the answer. So it's, it is a home ignition problem and not a wildfire control problem. We need to look to ourselves, not to others. Remember about embers and it's relatively straightforward. We can keep chipping away and making our, harm, our homes more and more fire resistant over time. So uh, we shouldn't feel hopeless. We're not victims in this. We can, we can solve those issues. And uh, I really encourage you to work together as a team. And I really think that you've got an advantage through the round table process. There may be other stakeholders to involve when you're looking at the problem from this scale, but I think that's, you're not far from that. Um, so I wish you the best of luck and uh, 
Go for it.